Okay, well, first of all, can I uh, just, uh, by way of introduction to the meeting tonight, uh, I just, just say a few words about myself, and there's a little bit of history in here as well. Uh, I'm the chairman of Denby Dale Amateur Radio Club, which is located, uh, the, the uh, club has been located for the last 50 years in the small town of Denby Dale in West Yorkshire. And I'm, uh, I'm currently the chairman. When lockdown started nearly a year ago now, we had a discussion about what we were going to do. And I suggested that we should have a go at putting on online meetings. Uh, I'd had some experience of it through my working life of running meetings in this country and elsewhere, small and large, and suggested that uh, online meetings might be the way to go. So the club let me get on with it. And I started to write to all kinds of people that I'd seen them writing articles in Practical Wireless, RAGCOM, uh, QST, and so on. And uh, surprisingly for me, every single person I approached uh, volunteered to come and speak at the club, probably because we were probably and possibly one of the first in the UK to organize online meetings. And I'm really pleased that it's now taken off in this country and we've got more and more radio clubs across the whole of the UK organizing online meetings. One of the things that we've decided in Denby Dale is that when we are able to, whenever that is, uh, have physical meetings again, we're gonna run them online and in, and in person at the same time partly because we've attracted a group of visitors from around the country and partly because we know we've got uh, some people who have got disabilities, some people who find that the travel now, particularly in the winter months, is not very good in the evenings to, uh, to turn up somewhere for a, for a meeting. And we've decided that we're going to run what we're going to call hybrid meetings and run them online and in person at the same time. So there's a thought, Tristan, for, for you and everyone else. So I just want to say that by introduction. Uh, I'm also not going to um, claim any particular originality about what I've been up to, but I want to start uh, with uh, a picture. And uh, these are clearly not stealth antennas. Uh, this is Rob Sherwood, um, NC0B, who is very famous in the United States and is known to many amateurs in this country for the Sherwood reports on HF radio performance. And Rob's been writing them for about uh, 45 years, I think, he said to me. And we had uh, Rob uh, was about to come and speak at the club. So Rob and I had had an online discussion about his talk at the club on his reports and what kind of meeting it was going to be. And uh, I looked him up on QRZ and I saw this incredible array of antennas outside a tiny house in Colorado in the uh, west of the United States of America. And uh, funnily enough, just three days after talking to Rob, I'd been invited to talk to the Long Island CW Club uh, based in uh, New York City uh, on stealth antennas. And uh, this picture was just so fantastic that I thought I would uh, put it as my opening slide on stealth antennas, uh, partly because uh, probably I'm not alone in the room of amateurs that we've got here tonight, in that I've never had the space to put up a single one of those antennas, and nor in most of my life have I had the money to put up any of those antennas. So my only experience of operating beam antennas has been occasionally in the shacks of other amateurs, but more likely when the club has put on an event or a special station and we've put up a, a beam antenna of some sort to operate. And that's been my only experience of HF beam antennas. Uh, probably like everyone else, I've looked at some of these wonderful antennas. We've got a guy in our club who's got uh, three 60 foot mass in his property. And when I went to see him a few years ago, uh, because he invited me and a couple of others over, uh, we all just stood in awe standing in the driveway of his house at these incredible 
antennas, you know, a, a two element beam for 40 meters and so on uh, that he had on the top of these huge masts. Uh, and thinking, God, if we could just have one of those, it would be fantastic. Uh, for most of us uh, in England uh, in particular, it's an impossibility. An impossibility because very few of us have got the space uh, to put up anything like this. Um, and unlike um, uh, many of the amateurs in the United States, very few of us have got the money to, to invest in those type of antennas. Um, I, I started my radio journey in 1965. That's my dad uh, who uh, brought me into the hobby. He discovered when he gave me a transistor radio at the age of 11, that uh, when I took it to bits and slightly retuned the, uh, the aerial inside it, uh, which was a, a, an AM medium wave receiver, I started hearing these people talking to each other. And what I subsequently discovered was top band AM, 160 meters AM radio, and they were radio amateurs. And my dad asked if I was interested. And uh, I said, very much so. And that resulted in a trip to his dad's house where he disappeared up in the loft and came down with all this stuff that he had built in the, 19, in the 1940s. Uh, that had been up the loft all that time and uh, he got his license and uh, that was uh, on, on the shack there you can see a a transmitter a valve transmitter in the middle of there with an am and uh, cw transmitter that my dad built um, and various other bits including a cr100 marconi receiver one or two of you might remember as well and I just start with that because my, my involvement in amateur radio has always been as an amateur. Um, I've never had any professional interest in amateur radio or radios or science. My working life has been uh, in a completely different field altogether and certainly didn't involve uh, any radio equipment. Um, so my, my, my starting point was with my dad in the uh, mid 1960s. Uh, getting involved with playing with radios and of course uh, when my dad had this uh, setup that we put up he and I put up the ubiquitous uh, full-size G5RV from the top of the chimney in the house across to a derelict building that was on some land behind us uh, that uh, and and I remember helping him make uh, some homemade um, uh, twin feeder 300 ohm or more uh, twin feeder that we made uh, to uh, to feed the antenna through the shack window, so that that was that was my starting point to radio. Uh, I learnt Morse code, of course, in the 1960s uh, from a from an old Columbia record that I've still got one. There's a picture of it I took there. We we with my dad, we'd we'd actually sat down together uh, with this uh, with this record um, and uh, and taught ourselves Morse code. Uh, so that uh, we could both get our licenses. My dad, of course, got his before I did. Uh, my first ever contact was uh, was using my dad's call sign. In 1966, there's a QSL card um, for my first contact in February 1966 with a homemade transmitter and, of course, a homemade antenna. Uh, that was me in the 1970s. Um, and... Um, I was living at the time in a in a small uh, flat on the second floor of a 1930s uh, council block of flats in southeast London in uh, in Deptford in southeast London. So uh, there was no balcony, of course. There was absolutely no prospect at all of any outside antenna. And uh, my first aerial that uh, that I got to use, I, I bought. It was a commercial bit of kit. And uh, some of the uh, older people in the room may well remember the uh, Partridge joystick. Uh, G3 VFA was his call sign. And it was a seven and a half foot um, pole uh, with a, a loading coil in it and, uh, and an ATU. And uh, it uh, operated uh, on all the HF bands. And as, it's, as in the top picture of the cartoon here, uh, that was uh, against the wall of my shack. And uh, I operated that uh, using CW uh, on anything from five watts to 150 watts at the time. And in fact, on that antenna on the second floor of a council block of flats, very, very close to the River Thames, probably a mile away from the Thames, so very low down, 
uh, I, I operated and, and made my first contact uh, with VK land uh, from that inside antenna. And what that taught me was that we can live in the most compromised and the most difficult situation to operate radio, but we can still operate HF radio and have fun with it. And I know, and I'm not going to talk about them, but I know that people do use antennas inside their properties, sometimes dipoles across the, the ceilings of houses, obviously in the loft as well, and I'll come to that later on. Uh, at the time, uh, I built myself a, a homemade uh, transceiver and a homemade ATU. There they are in, the, in my uh, shack um, and uh, operated uh, CW only using five watts to start with, with that VFA antenna. Uh, when I moved house, I, I played with various aerials. Uh, I played with the G5RV, which I abandoned reasonably early on, uh, got into... Uh, playing with dipoles and seeing what I could do to uh, fit them into the very small spaces that I had in any gardens. Uh, I moved a few years ago up to Yorkshire and uh, we bought a house here which was one of these modern properties. Uh, it was a, a new build property and a bit like in the United States with what they call the HOA agreements where there are contractual restrictions on what people can and can't do uh, in, their, in their properties. And the HOAs in America are about restricting uh, the use of uh, any external antennas. Uh, I've got a contract on the property I own here, uh, which says that we're not allowed to put up any external areas or tool. So I had to think about this and thought, well, what am I gonna do? And I went back to my early days uh, but I, if you look at my garden here, I've got a garden that's about uh, 30 foot by 36 foot, a fence across the bottom, 36 foot wide, uh, get running up each side of the house on either side, six foot high fence, very common indeed. I've got a couple of advantages in my garden and I'll come to one at the end, but I'll mention one now. Uh, I live in the town of Penniston in South Yorkshire. We're halfway between uh, Sheffield and Huddersfield, uh, just on the edge of the Peak District National Park. And um, the, the property I live in, the area where it was built, is on, a, is on a promontory of land which slopes away. So if you look at my back fence there, you can see some trees immediately beyond those trees. So six feet beyond those trees, it drops down immediately about 30 feet. So I've got a I've got a, a drop off very, very quickly off the back of the property. So one of the things I thought about doing, and I, I'll come to it uh, a bit later on, was could I use that fence to support an aerial that no one's ever going to see? That was my first thought. My, my second thought was that they had very kindly uh, put a, a tree in the garden when they uh, planted out uh, the uh, the gardens on these new build properties and I had a tree that measures about 15 feet high and as you can see it's got various bits of support strapped to it because Peniston uh, we're about um, 670 feet above sea level where I live here we get very very strong winds uh, blowing through the area here and uh, for these trees to survive particularly these youngish trees that they've planted uh, they have to support them. So we've got some wonderful bits of wood and uh, cane uh, trying to uh, keep this uh, tree from being destroyed by the winds. But that gave me an idea. I kind of thought, well, look, I've got a 15 foot tree. What could I do with that? And so my starting point was a quarter wave antenna on 20 meters, a quarter wave ground plane antenna on 20 meters is, as we know, roughly uh, five meters, about um, 16 foot six, isn't it? Uh, 16, something like that. So 16 foot six long is the, uh, in imperial terms, the, uh, the quarter wave antenna for 20 meters. The tree wasn't quite long enough, but if I ran a 16 foot six piece of wire to the top of the tree, uh, and just attached it to the tree and fed it from the bottom of the tree 
against uh, bits of wire that I could sink into the ground and take out the back of the property through that fence at the back and sink them on the ground behind, I could probably get a quarter wave antenna for 20 meters in there. And that's what I did. And I found it was working extremely well. Uh, because the tree was only 15 foot high, uh, the top one and a half foot of it was literally draping down a bit from the top of the tree. I mean, I had some fun putting it up. I used a, a 10 meter fishing pole and we fiddled around with uh, various uh, various bits of uh, attachments to the top of it to, to loop my wire over the top of the tree and loop over uh, the additional one and a half foot. So I had 16 and a half foot of wire going up the tree. And that worked extremely well. And I found actually that uh, I could operate that on everything from five watts. I'm a QR peer as well as a QR hour. I use anything between five and 400 watts, depending on how I'm feeling and what I want to do and what conditions are like. And I discovered that I could put uh, any, any, uh, any of those powers into that tree and it worked extremely well. Uh, so um, I, that, that's another picture of the garden and that's another picture of the tree. Uh, what I, what I, I then moved on from that and I, I decided I'd put three wires in it. So I had one for 20, one for 15 and one for 10. And it kind of worked and uh, I could get um, a, a, a 50 ohm match on it using my ATU. Um, I could radiate on all three bands. It was best on 20 meters, not so good on 15 and 10, but it did work. Uh, but in the end, I, I ended up um, uh, spending actually not an awful lot of money, just uh, 100 pounds on a very, very cheap, uh, imported it from Germany. I probably wouldn't do it nowadays, uh, but I imported it from Germany, a, 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 a trapped uh, quarter wave for 20, 15 and 10. And, uh, and that is literally, you can just, if you look at the, uh, the top of the tree there, if I can just show you, um, I'll just, um, oh, hang on, I've gone back one there, I didn't mean to do that, hold on a second. Right, what I was, what I was about to show you was at the top of the tree, uh, you can just make out behind the top of the tree, the vertical bit of the, 2015 and 10 ground plane, which which fits very, very neatly into the size of the tree. And I have literally um, tied it to the tree. So I've got a, 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 a three band uh, vertical antenna tied tied to the tree. And I found that was an immediate improvement, uh, resonant improvement on 15 and 10 meters and works extremely well. I mean, I'm really, really, uh, delighted with that as an antenna. Uh, my, my next uh, thought was that the, the bit of land behind my property there, uh, no one can go on it. It's a six foot strip of land. Uh, it's, it's blocked off a bit further down, a few hundred meters off the end of it. There's another housing estate, but you can't get onto the land behind. So I decided that I would make use of the back of that fence. And uh, what I've put into the back of the fence is a delta loop. So that I've got the, the horizontal bit of the fence at the top supporting the longest bit going down into a V-shaped and fed from the bottom. Uh, so I've got a, a 17 meter piece of wire uh, operating as a delta loop, which I've discovered obviously radiates on 17 it does work on six meters as well. I was hoping it was going to work on 12, but uh, it, I can get it to, to load on it, but doesn't, uh, it doesn't uh, radiate terribly efficiently on, uh, on 12, but works very well on 17 and uh, reasonably well on six meters as well. Uh, since, I, since I wrote this talk, I've decided uh, over Christmas uh, to make a change to that antenna and decided that because I've got enough space in there, I'm going to I'm going to try and I've built it and I haven't put it in there yet. I'm going to replace the delta loop uh, with a with a fan dipole for 17 meters and 12 meters. 
and uh, I, I obviously I've I've used a fan dipole before for those two bands because they fit into reasonably small spaces, but I'm literally going to support it at the top of the the fence, at the back of it, on, on so it's not visible from the garden here. Um, and um, I, I'm obviously aware as well that the um, I can um, operate uh, the 17 meter dipole on on six meters as well. So I'll, I'll have antennas that will operate on 17, 12 and 6. Don't know yet how well that's going to work, but if anyone's interested to know in the next few weeks when the temperature improves a bit and I'll get out in the garden for a few hours, I'll, I'll get that fitted up and, uh, and trimmed uh, and uh, see how it's working. So um, what I've done uh, for my um, uh, main antenna, my, apart from the one I've got for 2015 and 10, is that I have put in uh, a piece of wire and you can see I've literally stapled it to the top of the fence. So that fence I showed you in the first picture running around the garden, that piece of wire is about 132 foot long, off center fed dipole. So it's long, one length is longer than the other. And in the corner of my fence, if I just go back to that, if you look in that right hand corner of the fencing, um, that's where the feed point is down there where I've got a four to one uh, ballon uh, feeding uh, the coax into the antenna. And that works again, extremely well on 80 and on 40, and it will radiate reasonably well on 30 meters as well. Uh, so that's that's my, my other HF antenna. It works, uh, you would expect it because it's reasonably low off the ground, uh, really to kind of operate as a, an MVIS antenna to, to be sending signals pretty well up and, and not uh, in a way to work any DX. But I can assure you that, I mean, last night I was on 40 metres, put out a CQ call about 9pm uh, uh, on CW on 40 and back came a station from Columbia, uh, giving me something like 559 from Columbia. So that was with 150 watts. I think I was operating last night uh, doing that. So that that works that works extremely well. The only problem I've had with it, I can tell you, is well, I, sorry, I just introduced this. Um, I, I've got one of those Ameritron uh, remote control switches in the garden. I've now got so many bits of wire in the garden. Um, I didn't want to run all that coax into the garden. I wanted to run just one single piece of coax. So the Ameritron remote coax switch enables you to switch over the antenna. So I can put in up to, on the one I've got, it's, it will take uh, four, four inputs. Um, I can put four antennas on it and have one coax feed back to the shack. So I've buried the coax back to the shack in the back of the garden and comes all the way around and through the back wall into the shack here. The only problem I've had uh, with the, uh, 80 meter off center fed dipole is when I've put 400 watts through it, I think um, I, I've made three different four to one balance. And they've all operated and they all seem to take uh, higher power without much problem. Uh, but one day I came in with the first version of the balance I made and uh, the, the ATU was going absolutely haywire. And I thought, what the hell has happened here? I must have a short somewhere and looked at the cable into the back of the radio and looked at the, uh, the cables coming into the house and it was all looked absolutely fine. When I went outside and had a look, uh, the, uh, and I opened up the ballon that I'd made, uh, there was a very, very nasty, <laughs> a very, very nasty bit where bits of it have fused together and burnt out. And I suspect that what was going on here that we, because the antenna is, is not in, it's in a pretty compromised position really, isn't it? An off center fed dipole really should be as far as you can get it to be a, a horizontal line antenna. And because it's nothing like that at all, there are some pretty nasty uh, voltages which are floating around inside it and pretty high currents particularly if you're putting, you know, anything more than QRP powers through this. So I got through two more of these uh, balance that I was making every time I, I, I increased the, uh, the gauge of the wire that I was using. 
and uh, and tried to make it all as solid and and um, uh, uh, and voltage and current proof as I could possibly make it, but failed on three attempts and and so uh, bit the bullet in the end and I bought this from the DX shop. And they sell a lovely expensive uh, ballon, um, which is a combi a hybrid of a four to one voltage ballon and a one to one current current ballon. I'm sure I could make it myself. Uh, but I'd had such a disappointing time with the ones I'd already built and uh, was very disappointed. I, I, I bought this uh, one from the DX shop and it is superb. It absolutely will take anything that I throw at it. I mean, I've obviously not tried to put uh, more than 400 watts through it, but it, it comfortably deals with that. Very, very stable indeed. I don't have any difficulty at all with SWR, whatever the conditions are. However wet it's been, however wet that fencing is, makes no difference to the uh, SWR that the antenna is showing uh, through the feeding that I'm that I'm running on it. Whereas I do have some problems with the um, the uh, 20 meter, uh, 15, 10 meter vertical uh, ground plane. Uh, when it's very wet or as we've had over the last few weeks there's a lot of snow and ice around the SWR does move a little bit I may have to retune the ATU maybe every you know five or ten minutes I can see the SWR just changing a little bit and I just tweak it and that's sufficient but uh, nothing to worry me and uh, it's it's pretty well around the same point all the time uh, another antenna I tried, and I'll tell you why I abandoned that, obviously around the guttering of the house, I've got the modern plastic guttering that runs around our house. Uh, so that's that's the one, that's the back, top of the back of it. Uh, obviously what I did was I, I took a 40 meter off center fed dipole and ran that round the guttering and round each side of the house. And while that loaded up very nicely and transmitted reasonably well, um, I used some very, very thin wire. It's still up there now that I attached with tiny clips to the guttering. I, I don't think any of you can see the wire. I, I uh, purchased that um, Soda Beams uh, light wire that they, um, they sell, the brown version of it. It's a very, very uh, fine gauge, something like 28 gauge wire I think it is it's it's quite a small wire and um, I've put that up there you can't you absolutely cannot see it it radiates okay uh, I mean I've certainly radiated a decent signal on uh, uh, with uh, with five watts of power into it however it does pick up a lot of noise from my house um, you know I've got one of these lovely modern houses that's got you know fans in every bathroom that kick in if the moisture content goes up uh, and they're whirring quietly in the background all the time anyway, as they recommend you to do in these modern houses with shed loads of insulation. You know, I've, I've got a, or I'd had at the time when I put this up, my teenage daughter who thankfully is away at university now, who's got about 25 devices with uh, all kinds of wonderful power supplies on it that are all radi radiating all kinds of wonderful noises all of which seem to be picked up by that antenna. So I found it very, very noisy to receive on. It really was not an antenna to use. I've still got it, uh, but really I prefer my 80 meter one for 80 and 40. Uh, that, what I do for VHF and UHF is I've got one of those um, um, uh, tripods uh, with a, a pole that uh, will drop down to six foot off the ground. And when I'm using it, I just just nip outside and stick the antenna up to, you know, 12, 15 feet. Uh, and I can tell you on two meters when there's been lifts from this location here, and I know we are 670 feet above sea level, and I've got a good takeoff in that direction, very good takeoff to the uh, southeast from here. Um, I've worked into Holland comfortably, regularly, into Germany and into Italy on two meters using just 30 watts of RF. Um, I, the bit I'm, I'm thankful for, um, uh, this is um, Penistone, uh, the town in which I live, and uh, that, uh, that steelworks uh, went up in the late 1800s, 
And it's actually where I live now. Our little estate of 30 houses is built on the site of that steelworks. So that steelworks was there in the late 19th century, early 20th century. It got knocked down in the 1920s and David Brown built a foundry on the site here. And uh, David Brown, uh, where I'm sitting now on this location during the Second World War built tank casings, uh, Spitfire engine casings and uh, very large shell casings in the factory here. And I have got absolutely no doubt whatsoever that underneath this house, so when they dug these bits of land out to build these houses, some of, I mean, they did actually uncover two unexploded bombs that were still on the site here from when David Brown's had their factory here. Uh, thankfully, only two of them they discovered. There may be more under here, God only knows. Um, but I am absolutely certain there is a lot of steel and iron buried in the ground underneath where these gardens and houses are where I'm living. And I suspect that helps my radiation, certainly with my ground plane antenna. I mean, I've got about 10 radials um, underneath uh, for my HF uh, vertical. Uh, but I, I really do think that um, the exceptionally good results I'm getting from that vertical uh, come from the buried steel and iron. Uh, I just want to tell a very, very quick tale because Dick uh, G0 BPS has popped into the meeting tonight. Dick's one of the uh, officers of the GQRP club, by the way, and uh, we've worked together with uh, uh, some of the GQRP activities online uh, with their convention last year. And uh, Dick uh, had emailed me to say he was coming tonight and it reminded me of the house I lived in 20 years ago. Uh, this is it. Um, the, the, the picture on the right is the front of the house. The picture on the back is my garden. And uh, I, I had a, a stealth antenna up there using that very, very light gauge wire, a uh, you know, 20, 25, 28 gauge, whatever it is, uh, wire. Um, and what I'd done with it was, as, I mean, the, you can see the uh, the front of my house, uh, the, the roof um, goes up to the top there and the, and the back garden is the opposite, obviously, of the front of the house. So what I did was I, I attached a, uh, a, a nylon bit of uh, fishing line to a tennis ball and after a few goes from my back garden, I chucked it over my house and then I attached eventually um, a wire to it. And that wire was a um, length of, um, uh, of wire, 66 foot long. So a, a 40 meter length of loop of wire. So the, the center point of it was at the top of the, the, uh, the roof there. And it came down and in, in the back of my garden on the left, you can just about see Hang on a second, let's just go back to this, don't need to do that. Um, just about see in the back left hand corner of my garden, there's a pole there, just appearing six foot high and I have one the other side. So I have my, my V shaped antenna coming from the roof of the house out to the garden uh, so that one end was there, one end was there with the wire going across the top there and it dropped down to the middle and I fed it in the back of the garden there, again with a four to one ballon. And that worked spectacularly well. And uh, my neighbors and I was very friendly with neighbors on both sides, never, if they ever saw that wire, no one ever asked me what it was uh, and no one ever commented on it until one day, uh, thankfully only a year or so before we moved house actually, I got a knock on the uh, on the front door at four o'clock in the morning um, and I thought, my God, what's going on? And I went downstairs to be greeted by my neighbor in his dressing gown to tell me, Nick, he said, there's a seagull caught in a wire in your back garden. And uh, when I when I went out to my back garden uh, there at, um, you know, 25 foot above the ground was this seagull that had got itself tangled in the wire. And uh, it really was tangled in it. And I thought, oh my God, what am I gonna do? Uh, I can remember now, and we still laugh about it at home. I, I said to my wife and daughter, who by then were awake as well, can you give me a hand getting this seagull down? And they said, we're not going anywhere near that. 
I mean, it was going absolutely bonkers, this seagull. Uh, but I was able to lower the wire, uh, so just a few feet off the ground, uh, and uh, I chucked a towel over the head of the seagull, which did calm it down, and I managed to then untangle the wire. It stood on its rickety legs and flew off. And um, the next day, my, uh, my next door neighbor was talking to me about this and asking me what the wire was for, and I explained to him it was my radio aerial. And I also explained to him, I think I, I saved his carp. He had a lovely, his, his back garden was taken up with 50% of his garden with this huge pond in which he had a great pile of koi carp. And I said to him, I've got no doubt whatsoever that seagull had seen your carp and was flying down for something to eat uh, and uh, didn't notice the wire. And my, my wire protected your fish um, and uh, Pete. And uh, I don't think he was convinced with the explanation, but uh, uh, it just it just showed me that wherever you are, wh whatever limitations you've got in terms of space and in terms of how close you are to to other houses. And you can see at that time I was living in a, a terraced house, um, you know, literally right next to houses on both sides. Uh, you can still radiate and and contact stations all over the world, which I've definitely done. Obviously, if you fail, uh, I just wanted to show you what you do if you fail in terms of being able to put up aerials at home. Uh, this is me operating when I lived in Essex uh, down by the Thames estuary. Uh, the water's out, but that's me with a 20 meter uh, quarter wave vertical antenna uh, with radials um, at the edge of the sea. And you can see a boat there, the tide comes in uh, with the, with the, from the estuary and I'm sitting right next to the water. And you can see it in the picture behind that QRP transmitter I was using, uh, the, the mud flats, uh, that was with the tide out. When the tide comes in, the water's right up to the side of me, uh, having a great time. And, and again, that shows me, and I know many amateurs do do this, if you are really stuck for operating from home and you wanna put up a bigger aerial and you wanna put up something uh, which is maybe your neighbours aren't going to be terribly happy with, uh, then why not go off and find a bit of land somewhere as I did next to the Thames Estuary, public land, um, and, uh, and play for the day there. And that, that, that's, uh, that spot down by, down by the Thames Estuary was a, was a favourite spot for me. I just want to finish uh, with, with a slight plug. I've got no commercial interest in this, but uh, the RSGB have got a great bookshop and... Uh, this book by Steve Nichols, G0KYA, who's written uh, a, an excellent book on stealth antennas. So if anyone's interested in looking and trying to get some ideas and inspiration for things they can do, uh, you wouldn't go far amiss by getting uh, Steve's antenna. Steve, incidentally, uh, Tristan, is, is very happy to come and talk to clubs. He's also a the uh, HF propagation expert, uh, writing columns in Radcon for many years on HF propagation uh, and uh, he came and spoke at our club last year on HF propagation. Fantastic uh, talk um, and I would recommend that as a, as a talk for you. So uh, Steve, that's, that's, uh, that's my bit. Uh, Tristan, sorry, uh, I finished. Uh, that's it. I'm open to uh, questions and comments and observations on anything I've introduced you to. Well, uh, thank you ever so much, Nick, for a very entertaining talk. Um, it wasn't entertaining for the seagull, of course, um, but I was, I was quite intrigued by the joystick antenna to um, start off with. But on behalf of uh, Barry Radio Society, and also I hope I speak for Borrington Amateur Radio Club, I'd like to thank you for an excellent talk and uh, for spending your evening with us today. So I'll hand it over to, uh, to anybody with questions. Remember to unmute your mics if you'd like to ask Nick a question. Thank you, Nick.